an important subject. Let's bring on Brother Minister Louis Farrakhan, National Representative of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, the one God to whom all praise is due, the Lord of the world, who came in the person of Master Farad Muhammad, to whom praise is due forever, and in the name of his true servant and last messenger, the seal of the prophets of Almighty God, the exalted Christ, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, I greet you, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the greeting words of peace in the Arabic language. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Once again, I want to express our deep gratitude to those of you who are here at the Final Call Administration Building and those of you in the city of Chicago and around the country who helped to support this radio ministry. It makes us feel very good to know that you love the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad enough that you would support this ministry of truth going out to our people. Our subject today is entitled Divorce. I intend by the help of Allah to deal with this subject from the aspect of physical marriage and divorce to the higher aspect of that word which deals with spiritual divorce. Now according to Webster's dictionary, divorce is a legal dissolution of the bonds of marriage. Divorce represents a complete, irrevocable separation of two persons who have agreed to live together as one. In the United States of America, according to the, stati the statistics of their social scientists, America suffers from a very high divorce rate. Over 50% of all of those who marry get divorced and many are divorced within the first year or two of their marriages. A high divorce rate is a sign of a society in decline. In the history of world government, the rise and fall of nations is dictated by the destruction of family life. When you have a strong family, a strong bond of marriage, you have a strong nation. Whenever in the social fabric of a nation the family life is interfered with and marriage is destroyed, then we see a nation in decline. These signs were present in the fall of Babylon, in the fall of Rome, in the fall of the ancient governments of the world, and this is prevalent now in the Western world, and more so in the United States of America, as a sign of the decline of this world's power. Wrapped up in divorce, is the lack of commitment to our own word. Each of us who marry make a statement in the company of witnesses and it is a statement really an oath to Almighty God that we have chosen this particular person to live together under varied circumstances. We've chosen to live together in sickness and in health, for better or for worse, as the Christian ceremony goes, 
or richer or poorer, till death of do part. But our word fails because the moment adversity comes in that marriage, we think of giving it up. The moment the adverse condition tests the commitment of us to our word, we find ourselves wanting. Therefore today, I'm speaking particularly of black families, over, over 50% of all black marriages end in divorce. Now we already know how difficult it is for two human beings to find the path of unity where two human beings can resolve the conflict within themselves and among themselves to become as one. That's a big step in life. But when there fails to be a resolution of conflict, and the conflict becomes so great that argument is constantly present in that marriage. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad has said to us that argument drives away the spirit of Allah. And when Allah's spirit is absent, there is nothing that can keep two people together. The sign of Allah's spirit is the love of two people for each other. And that love that two people have for each other makes their marriage able to weather the storms that Almighty God brings to every life. We cannot go through life without being tested. We cannot go through life without being tried. We cannot go through life running away from adversity. God makes us, according to the teachings of the Holy Quran, to face difficulty. Because it is only through facing and overcoming difficulties that character is strengthened in both parties. Now, the Quran permits divorce. But in the sayings of Prophet Muhammad, it is a hateful thing in his sight. Allah hates divorce. Naturally, if the Bible and Quran teach us that Allah, God, is one God, then Allah loves unity. He loves peace and accord and agreement between the people. But when the peace is broken, then the division comes in and the one God is against divisiveness. So he hates divorce though he permits it when there is no more love present in the marriage. If there is no more love present, then you have nothing to build upon. But look at the pain now in divorce. Two people who really want to be separated from each other. Still, when you come to the point of divorce, you come to a traumatic, painful circumstance in life. Because if there are children involved, the poor children do not like to choose between a mother and a father. They all, in their simplistic view of life, want to see the mother and the father stay together. Whenever there is a divorce, there is a traumatic, psychological uh, condition brought about among the children. Naturally, the same condition exists among the parents. And sometimes the divorce is filled with so much acrimony, so much bitterness, so much hatred, that a judge, in trying to settle the divorce, trying to see what is just between the two parties. Each party vying to get the upper hand over the other, contending the divorce on different grounds. Well, the pain of divorce 
is felt by everyone who has been involved in that. And that effect on the parents, on the husband and wife, is seen in the children. Divorce. The Quran, which is the book of scripture of the Muslims, takes a view of divorce that is somewhat different than the Christian concept of divorce. Allah in the 65th chapter of the Quran, titled Divorce, instructs the Prophet of Islam, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and the Messenger of Allah today, in these words, O Prophet, when you divorce women, divorce them for their prescribed period and calculate the period and keep your duty to Allah, your Lord. Turn them not out of their houses, nor should they themselves go forth unless they commit an open indecency. Here, Allah is saying to the messenger, when you divorce women, Divorce them for the prescribed period. In Islam, when two people feel that they cannot get along in peace, they agree to separate. And that separation is for a period of three months. During that time, the two must try to reconcile their differences. So Allah says, calculate the period and keep your duty to Allah. In Islam, when a man is separated from his wife and vice versa, <coughs> we are not permitted to go courting another woman until we have resolved the first matter that we are involved in. It is wrong to yourself. It is wrong to the mate. For two people to be separated, she's seeing another man, he's seeing another woman, and they have entered into conjugal relations, this interferes with there ever being a reconciliation between two people who are at odds. So the Quran tells the messenger, keep your duty to Allah, and this instruction is for those of us who love righteousness. If you have a disagreement with your wife or your husband and that disagreement is such where you feel that you should be separated from each other, there is not to be during that period any uh, idea in the mind of both parties, I've got another woman in view or I've got another man in view. Sometimes when you're having a problem with your wife or with your husband, you may see another man that looks good to you. Or you may see another woman that looks good to you. So you exaggerate the fault of each other because of the woman or man that has entered into your own heart and mind. It's like a person that wants to buy a new car and finds every kind of excuse to get rid of the old one even though it's running quite well. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. You can never reconcile differences between a husband and wife as long as somebody else is in your mind as a barrier between that reconciliation. Therefore, if a Muslim has a desire to divorce his wife and vice versa, that Muslim must keep their duty to Allah and remain chaste with no other party in mind. No other person should interfere with those two until that marriage is legally and completely dissolved in a complete divorce. But the first divorce is called separation. The second divorce is permanent. Let us read on. Come on, brother. Go ahead. Now, the Quran teaches that the wife 
should never be turned out of her house by the man. This is an awful thing for a man to have a woman, have children by the woman, have a difficulty with the woman, then throw her and the children out in the street. The Quran says no, this should not be done unless that wife commits an open indecency. And these are the limits of Allah. And what do you mean an open indecency? He does something that is so vile and filthy against the marriage that she forfeits her right to everything that her husband has built up for her. You just can't marry a Muslim man and he provide a way for you and then you go lay up with strange men and then enjoy this laying up because you don't like your husband and then the husband has to leave the house that he bought for you and you are that kind of filthy wife. This is awful. The judges of this world judge by their law. In Islam, and of course the Christians are to do the same, they should judge by the book that God has revealed. You and I should never let the wicked be the judge over the matters of our own. We are given the wicked power over us when God wants to cut off the wicked from making a judgment over his servants. This is wrong. Even if we have a disagreement, the Holy Quran and the Bible teach us against going to our enemy to solve our problems. If we both believe in Almighty God, and Christians, if you believe in Jesus Christ, according to the Bible, you are not supposed to take your disagreement between an unbeliever or an infidel and let an infidel solve the problems of believing people in God. This is disbelief on our own part if we do such. Now, Allah says, whoever goes beyond the limit of Allah, he indeed wrongs his own soul. Thou knowest not that Allah may after that bring about an event. Now, what the Quran is hinting at, as the scholars uh, say, is that when two people have decided that they cannot get along and they separate, the period should be for three months. During this three month period, you should keep your duty to Allah and keep your duty to that husband and that wife. Even though you are separated, you are not separated from responsibility. So many men divorce the woman and walk out on the children and will not give anything for the care of their children. Brothers and sisters, this is wrong. We are admonished by Allah in his Quran to keep our duty to Allah. And keeping our duty to Allah means keeping our contract that we have said in his name and in his presence with each other. You are still bound to each other even though you are separated. So don't exceed the limits because you don't know maybe Allah will bring about an event that will reconcile the two parties that have become separated. So the Quran says to Muhammad, so when they have reached their prescribed time, retain them with kindness or dismiss them with kindness. Now look at the instructions of Allah. After the three month period, Muhammad is told, you may retain your wife, keep her. But if you retain her, you retain her with kindness. And if you choose to dismiss her, you dismiss her in the same spirit, with kindness. Look at our marriages and our divorces. We get divorced and become bitter enemies sometimes of each other. 
the wife telling the children ugly things about the husband. The husband, when he gets the children for a minute, he says ugly things about the wife. They are both unkind to each other, and this produces a tremendous effect on the minds of the children. Even if you cannot agree to live together in peace as husband and wife, the Quran says you should remember that you are brothers and sisters in the faith. It is awful to see men and women who are Muslims or men and women who are Christians who have to divorce and yet divorce out of the spirit of Christ which is the spirit of love. Even if you cannot get along and you find that you both are incompatible, why should two Christians be hateful of each other going to the same church? Why should two Muslims who have to divorce be hateful of each other going to the same mosque? Look how hypocritical we are. We profess Christ with our lips. We profess Muhammad with our lips. But when it comes down to putting into practice the principles of these men of God, then we fall far short. We should retain or dismiss each other with a spirit of kindness. Now, brothers and sisters, this physical divorce, which is so painful, if the two people have something in common with each other. If there is no pain involved at all, then there was never any love at all. So the marriage should never have taken place at all. But if you have loved the man and the man has loved the woman and you come to the point of separation there has to be some spiritual pain involved in that act of separation now the way you handle your marriage I'm going to say this for you is more than likely the way you will handle your commitment to God I'm going to repeat that Men and women do not change in character, basically. The way you handle your marriage and its adversity is more than likely the way you will handle your commitment to God. God does not bring any of us to Him except through trial, tribulation, and adversity. Paul says, no man enters into the kingdom of heaven except through trial and troubles and hard times. So now, if you run out on your wife or run out on your husband because times get hard, will you run out on God when times get hard? See, you're not tested now in the church. Most of you who do not make a commitment to live a righteous life are not tested by your being involved in a church endeavor. You go to church and it's a loose commitment. You sign up and say, I believe in Jesus, or I believe in Allah, or I believe in Jehovah. And you visit that place. <coughs> you may sing a hymn or two and enjoy the choir, put some money in, do a little light tithing or weak tithing, or maybe heavy tithing. And you say, I've done my job. But there's no commitment on our part to live up to the word of God. The scripture says, be ye not hearers of the word of God, be ye what? Doers of the word of God. Now, if we are to be doers of God's word, I ask you if we are judged today on how well we do by the word of God, how many do you think in the churches would make it? Come on. How many do you think in the mosques would make it? Very few. Because most of us are very hypocritical when it comes to doing or living up to the Word of God. We don't mind professing it. We don't even mind looking like the part. But we do mind playing the part 
jam up. Because in order to play the part, or really not play the part, but to be a righteous person, one must live in harmony with the standard of righteousness laid down by God and his prophets. And this entails a struggle. And this means a struggle with ourselves. It means a struggle for righteousness. It means a struggle against the forces of unbelief, the forces of wickedness. And that struggle is a long-term commitment. In the Quran it says, in a certain expedition that the Muslims engaged in, the hypocrites said, or Allah says of the hypocrites, had it been a near journey and a short gain, they all would have gone forth. All of us can run a race for a minute. Anybody can be right for a few minutes. You can be righteous for a month. You can be righteous for two months. You can be righteous for a year or two. But that's not what God wants. The race is not to what? To the swift. But to that person that can endure to the end. And since you don't know and I don't know when the end is, then that means when you commit your life to Almighty God, you're committing your life from that point to the end when you meet with Him in that which is called the judgment of the world. So that's a lifelong commitment. That's not a minute commitment. That's not a second commitment. That's a lifelong commitment to Almighty God. Is that right? And in that commitment, we have committed ourselves to struggle to make ourselves pleasing in his sight. We have committed ourselves to live upright to his word, to his truth, to his law. Now sometimes we're up, sometimes we're down. Sometimes it seems as though we're going along fine. Other times we are sick of ourselves because we've fallen down on the job. But the race is not to the swift. You've got to get up if you fall and keep on struggling. But if you say, oh, heck, it's just too tough. I, I'm sick of this. I don't want no more meetings. I'm sick of this. I'm tired of people telling me what to do. Ain't no people telling you what to do. It's Almighty God telling you what to do. And who is better at telling us what to do than he who is the originator of our life? But it's a struggle. So you walk out later. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Right. Brother, you coming to the meeting? What meeting? Sister, you coming to church? I'm through with that. Naturally, it's the kind of a church like a holiness church or Pentecostal church which makes the members try to live up to the word of God. I'm not talking about the Catholic church. I'm not talking about most of the Baptist churches. Because most of you do what you please in the name of God. And if the preacher makes a demand on you for righteousness, you will leave Reverend so-and-so and and go to a Reverend so-and-so down the street who will let you gamble, fornicate, be a freak, and do anything else you want to do. And all you got to do is do little acts for forgiveness and God, you know, that kind of God just, uh, you know, weak and whatnot. (laughs) But if somebody's going to live upright to the word of God, and cause us to live upright to the word of God, they've called us to struggle. They've called us to warfare. They've called us to fight hard in his way. And in that struggle, you get discomforted. In that struggle, sometimes it leads you to be in conflict with the forces of the world that control the, the, uh, the benefits coming to your life. Sometimes you have to be in conflict with your government over a principle of right. We are not told to be disobedient to government. We are told to respect authority, whether that authority is a believer or not. But if that authority causes us or asks us to do that which is against what God has asked us to do, then we don't recognize the government above God. God alone is our sovereign. And when it comes between God and man, as Peter had that decision to make, should I obey God or should I obey man? We always choose to obey God. And if it means coming in conflict with the government, then let that conflict be because we cannot bow down and serve man, mammon and God at the same time. So when a person says they believe in God, they're going to suffer hardship because you want to be what? 
you want to reconcile yourself to be with God. Look at Jesus. Come on. I hope everybody's with me. <laughs> Jesus said, me and my father are one. Look at what trial and tribulation he had to go through to be one with his father. Look at the suffering that Jesus had to endure to come to the point where he could be one with his father. He struggled to be at one with his God. So he and the God formed a marriage and there's no divorce between those two. There's no separation between those two. And the Jesus said, I have overcome the world to be one with my father. I was tempted of Satan in the wilderness, but I didn't give in. I remember that I wanted to be wedded to God. So I told Satan, get thee behind me. How about you? When you are married to a, a woman or married to a man, and adversity comes up in that marriage, maybe the man loses his job. Maybe he's unable to support you in this last six months like he did in the years of your marriage. And sometimes, wives, you forget how your husband supported you. And now that hard times have fallen on them economically, you don't pick up the slack. You don't say, I'm with you, baby. Let's keep going. As long as he's not a lazy man sitting down waiting on a check to come, he deserves your support. But if in that adversity you say, oh, lady, for this so-and-so, he ain't nothing. Let me and the children suffer like this. I'm through with him. I'm going right on downtown to get me a divorce. What about God? When God allows you to suffer a little bit for the word of truth. Yes, <coughs> when God straightens the means of subsistence for you. Where you think you should have more and God gives you less. Then you begin to entertain doubts about the God. Maybe. Maybe you say... Allah, now you always kept me comfortable. Come on, brother. Come you done turned your back on me too? Or will you say, I am Allah, and I return to him. He is my patron, and if he straightens the means of subsistence for me, I'm going to hold on to my God because I know a change is coming for me. I'll just wait till my change comes. I'll be like Job. I don't care what you do to me. I'm going to hold on to the handle that will never break off from me. That's the spirit of a truly righteous person. They don't fear adversity. They're not afraid of a misfortune coming. This is the thing that they love because it tests their word that they have said to Almighty God. The same word you give to your wife that you're going to be with her and she's going to be with you. These are the words that Muslims say in a higher level to Almighty God. A Muslim says, my prayer, my sacrifice, my life, and my death are all for Allah, the Lord of the world. We are telling the world, my prayers are for Allah. I want his pleasure. My sacrifices that I make in the cause of truth is for Allah. I live my life for Allah. And when I cannot any longer live my life in his cause, I give my life willingly in his cause because my whole being is dedicated to Almighty God. And this is what Jesus said himself in the New Testament. The first law, he said, is to love God. With what? All your heart. He didn't say part of it, some of it, three quarters of it, nine tenths of it. God don't work like that. He wants all or nothing at all. Come on, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said to us that Allah demands a hundred percent or nothing. Why should God take any less from us than a hundred percent? Love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. I mean that God is pulling on you. I want it all. You mean all? I said all. Yes, then how can a man who has given his all to God pledge allegiance to a government? Unless that government be the government of God. 
Every time you pledge your all to the government, then you have lied if you've given your all to God. I can't give my all to America. I can give my all to God. And as long as America's in harmony with God's will, then she gets my all because she's doing the will of God. But if America's not doing the will of God, and I'm trying to do the will of God, then I can't serve her and God at the same time. Do you understand that? <laughs> Love God with all your heart, all your soul. That means the very essence of your being. He wants that. And all your mind, all your intellect. I want you to give it all to me, he said. And the second command is like unto the first. Love your neighbor. Love your brother as yourself. And if you love me with all that you are supposed to love me with God talking, then you will love your brother as I have commanded you with what you are able to give your brother a brotherly love. But don't confuse your brother with me. Don't confuse your daughter with me. Don't confuse your friends with me. And when it comes time to choose between your friends and your mother and your father and your business and your talent over God's love, which one will you choose? Allah will test you with everything. So most people, according to the scripture, that start out committing themselves to God, they walk a few ways, a few paces, they walk a few days, and the scripture says, by and by, the cares of the world come in and choke out the life of truth in them, and they become tired and they don't want to struggle anymore and they divorce themselves from God. And when somebody separates themselves from the love of God because they don't want to struggle anymore to keep their word to Him, then to separate ourselves from the love of God is to be estranged from God. And the very word accursed which is ascribed to the devil. As every Muslim says, I seek refuge in Allah from or against the accursed devil, one that is driven away from the face of Almighty God. If you seek refuge in God from one that is driven from the face of God, then how can you say that and keep company with those who have broken their oath and their word to Almighty God? Come on, brother. Come on. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Well, Allah goes on in this 65th chapter called the divorce. And in the second part of it, He's not talking about a physical divorce. He's talking about a spiritual divorce and punishment. Listen to these words. And how many a town which rebelled against the commandment of its Lord and its messengers. So we called it to severe account and we chastised it with a stern chastisement. So it tasted the evil consequences of its conduct and the end of its affair was perdition. Now look, Allah is telling us, look at how many others before you broke their word to me. I sent them messengers and commandments and they rebelled. Do you understand what rebellion means? Yes, they didn't want to live according to the commandment of Almighty God. So they rebelled against that commandment, thus divorcing or estranging themselves from the God. So he says, we call that town or that city to severe account, and we chastised it with a stern chastisement, so it tasted the evil consequences of its conduct, and the end of its affair was perdition. Now, he says, Allah has prepared for them severe chastisement, so keep your duty to Allah, O men of understanding who believe. Allah has indeed sent down to you a reminder. Now, Allah is saying, <coughs> pardon me, 
to the people keep your duty to Allah O oh, men of understanding now look if you don't have understanding you will not be able to keep your duty don't you know sisters when you got understanding you can hold on to a man through his trial or you can hold on to a woman through her trial if you have understanding Sometimes if you have understanding, you'll get rid of the man. That's right. Sometimes if you really have understanding, you'll get rid of the woman. Because a believer cannot live with a hypocrite. Right. And a hypocrite cannot live with a believer. Right. So God is going to cause a separation even in households that what you're laying in bed with, you've got to be able to see the nature of the mind of your bed partner. You think you living with somebody you love until Allah throws the gauntlet down and you begin to find out you may be living with death itself. <laughs> Come on, brother. I don't have but a few more minutes, but I'm sorry, those of you who have to leave us at uh, the, the hour of two, but uh, all praise is due to Allah for this hour. Let me go on. Now look. Allah says in the Quran, Allah has indeed sent down to you a reminder, a messenger, who recites to you the clear messages of Allah so that what? He may bring forth those who believe and do good deeds from darkness into light. Now there is a divorce. In the beginning of the Bible, God said that darkness covered the earth. He had never said that he loved darkness. And God said, let there be what? Light. light. And there was light. And he saw the light that it was good. He said the light was good, not the darkness. The light was good. And he separated the light from the darkness. And one part he called day and the other part he called night. What does that mean? The Honorable Elijah Muhammad has taught us that when you and I believe in falsehood, which is another synonym for darkness, we do the deeds of darkness without conscious uh, effect. In other words, we can sleep with our brother's wife. We don't feel anything. We can sleep with our sister's husband. We don't feel anything. We can steal and lie and cheat and malign and slander and backbite and don't feel anything because we are dark in our mind and dark in our spirit because we are under the rule of falsehood. But when Almighty God allows light to come into our lives yes, and that light is a reminder sent down to us in the form of a messenger. And that messenger's job is to bring us out of darkness into light. So that messenger must give us truth that we can discern in our own minds the thoughts and the things of darkness. Now everyone that hears the word of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad knows the things of light and knows the things of darkness. I remember once there was a young girl, she must have been about 13 years old, and she was guilty of fornication. And she came and confessed to me. And she told me that her mother did not teach her that this was wrong. And she was crying and telling me that she should not be judged, in words, by the law of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad because she was really ignorant. She really didn't know because her mama never told her these things. So I brought this to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And he looked me in my face and said to me, Brother, don't you let that little girl put that over on you. I was dumbfounded because the little girl had my sympathy. He said, go ask her where she did her act.
fornication and fondling and playing with each other is sin. That's why you just don't openly do it in your mother's presence. Do you understand? So he told me, go back and put her out of the society. And I did exactly as he told, with no feeling in my heart that I was doing the wrong thing. I said, oh, this is awful. <laughs> this is terrible. And if the preachers would wake up to that which is written in their book and exercise the law of God as it is found in their book, you would find that they would be preparing a people to meet with Christ on their return. You are not, Reverend, preparing a people for Christ. You think Christ is going to accept all these fornicators, adulterous sissies and whatnot that are filling up the church? He most certainly will not. And he will turn you down also, Reverend. You got to get your act together and get the house of God together. You must separate and divorce yourselves from the things of darkness and cling to the things of light. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. A writ of divorce. Now, beloved, as we come near the conclusion of this portion of our subject matter, we need to look at the things of our life that we need to divorce ourselves from. Now look, sisters, when you have a husband that's beating you up all the time, making like life miserable for you, your friends tell you, child, if I was you, I just get away from him. And when you tell your friends, but I just love him, your friends tell your other friends, she's just a fool. <laughs> Haven't you told some of your friends that? You say that you should get away from things that are doing you harm and irreparable damage. You should leave that. Don't you think so? You should. Well, then what about the things in your life right now that are things of darkness that are destroying you as a person? Should not you divorce or separate yourselves from those kinds of things? Right. Suppose you're using a little reefer or snorting a little cocaine or spending so much money in the whiskey store that you cannot prepare a future for yourself nor your children. Don't you think you should divorce yourself from these things that are destroying your life? But it takes strength to make a divorce, don't it? See, it takes a lot of, it's going to be painful to separate yourself from the bottle. But when you think about how good it will be when you are free from alcohol, man, you can put the bottle down. Look at the cocaine that you may be snorting out there in radio land. Some white powder that you sniff up in your nostrils or free base or however you do it. Go ahead, go ahead. For a high is a fleeting moment and then it's gone. Look at how you are married to that which is destroying you. I'm saying to you, beloved, that Almighty God wants you to divorce yourself from that kind of activity that is destroying your life. Yes, it's painful to pull away from dope. Yes, it's painful to pull away from wine. Yes, it's painful to pull away from freakish behavior. It is painful to pull away from anything that has become a habit. But if the habit is destroying you and me, should not we divorce ourselves from that habit? Then the Honorable Elijah Muhammad says, Islam will give you the strength to divorce yourself from those things that are enemies to you. Well now, what about in your family? What about in your home? What about your loved ones? Christ says in the scriptures, Think not that I came to bring peace, nay, a sword. I come to set a son at variance with the father, a daughter at variance with the mother, the son-in-law at variance with the daughter-in-law. I come to break up your family and give you a new 
family. Two will be laying in the bed. I'm going to take one and leave one. Two will be grinding at the mill. I'm going to take one and I'm going to leave one. God is asking us to divorce ourselves from members of our own families who love disbelief above faith. You didn't hear me. I'm going to say it again. Almighty God Allah is asking us to divorce ourselves from members of our own families who love disbelief above faith. In the book of Corinthians, I think it's Second Corinthians 6 and 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. Look, Paul is talking to some people at Corinth and he's talking to them about their yoking themselves with things that they should be divorced from. Look at what he says. O oh, ye Corinthians, our speech to you is candid, very frank. Our heart is wide open. On our part, there is no constraint, but there is constraint in your affections. In fair exchange, open wide your heart to us. And look at what Paul is saying. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness, and what concord hath Christ with Belial, and what part hath he that believeth with an infidel, and what agreement hath the temple of God with idols, for ye are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. And I will be their people, and they, I will be their God, and they will be my people. Wherefore, Paul says, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Now, I will use that scripture to end the first part of this lecture, this first hour. But I'm going to go on after the broadcast for another half hour with your indulgence because you and I need to hear this part and really the part that I'm about to get into needs to be put on the radio and at another time I will do it. But if you would like a tape of today's broadcast up to this point, call right now 994-5775. Call right now if you would like a tape of today's broadcast, 994-5775. Now let us close this portion with this. If you and I have come forward to believe in the light and to follow the light, why should you keep company with those who love darkness over light? Are you listening? You say, but they are my friends. That's my main squeeze. That's my buddy. If you've got a buddy that loves darkness over light and you continue to have company with your buddy, your buddy will put you out of the light into darkness since you can't bring your buddy into the light. So if you cannot bring your friend, your main squeeze, your buddy, whatever you call it, into the light, then you better leave your buddy, your main squeeze, in the darkness and come to the light yourself if you want to remain in the light. For those of us who claim to be in the light, we have no right to be in fellowship with those of the darkness. Fellowship means that you have communion and brotherly love and warm relations. You can keep up kindly company with your friends who love darkness, but you cannot fellowship with them. You cannot spend all your time with them. For if you do, then you love the darkness more than you love the light. You love the things of evil more than you love the things of God. 
And this is why Jesus calls the people to give them a better brotherhood on a higher level. He said of his mother and his brother, my mother and my brother are they that do will of my father. I'm separating myself for things of the world and I'm you to come out of her and be ye not partakers of her sins and her plagues. Black man and woman, let's write a writ of divorce from the things of evil, from the things of the world, and even from white folks and their evil decadent society. Let's put our hope in the kingdom of Almighty God. Thank you for listening, and may Allah bless you as I greet you in peace. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, for a copy of today's tape, you can call right now, 994-5775. You can call right now, 994-5775. Thank you, Minister Farrakhan. Assalamu alaikum. Brothers and sisters, I want to thank Brother Farrakhan. Now, he's going to come back up and continue the subject. But I want to say that, um, I just want to say this, Minister Farrakhan had a bad cold, and I didn't even know it as he started talking, and it shows you how Allah cleared it up for him to get this subject over. We thank him. Let's give him a round of applause. Now, this is, of course, the July 4th holiday, and uh, folks are celebrating independence. And so we want to become independent of married two that are yoking us, us down to hell with them. Now I want to say something to every Muslim and non-Muslim that is present in this audience today. We're talking on divorce. Now, you may not know this, but I want you to consider, or you may not have thought about it, but I want you to consider Beloved, When Jesus was among his followers, he kept reminding them that a time was coming that he would no longer be with them physically, that he would be separate from them. Listen to this. You call it divorce. You may say Jesus never divorced himself from his disciples and followers. Yes and no. He kept giving his disciples conditions. If you keep my commandments, if you do thus and so and thus and so, I will be with you to the end of the world. Now, when the disciples saw Jesus in that horrible position of death, When the disciples thought that their Lord had left them or deceived them and they would not have become offended if they didn't think that he had deceived them. They understand what he was teaching them all the years he was among them. So when he fulfilled what he hinted to them and told them that he would have to fulfill, they became offended. And in their being offended at Jesus, they divorced themselves from him. And in divorcing themselves from him because they were offended, they lost his spirit. Are you listening? They lost his guidance. And the disciples fell apart. Now, the disciples came back to Jesus when Mary, Peter, and John, the sepulcher or the tomb empty, they said, He is risen. Is that right? When they came back among the disciples saying, He is risen. He's not dead. He's alive. 
Some of the disciples didn't readily agree. Some of them were upset at that announcement. But then they all came back to Jesus. And when they came back to him, there were terms under which he would accept them. Now listen to this carefully. Whenever there is divorce, there's a period where you consider whether you're going to be reconciled to the one that you're divorced from. Listen to this now. And if we have played the harlot, listen to me carefully, while the period of reconciliation is supposed to be going on, and we've laid up with strangers, we cannot come back to the Lord and Master of that house except on his terms we don't bring terms to the table of reconciliation are you listening when a woman deliberately listen lays up with another man and her husband divorces her but he still loves her when she comes back to him and they sit down to talk about reconciliation she really don't have terms she comes back almost unconditionally messed up honey I was wrong I know I should not have done what I did can you find it in your heart to forgive me whatever you desire I will do it I mean this has happened in real life just plain men and women am I right you trusted the man. The man violates the trust. You catch him in bed with another woman. It tears you apart. You're ready to get a divorce. He comes back. He don't come back. Now look, baby. He don't come back with no bravado. He don't come back with no big time demand. He comes back to you on bended knees. Honey, I am sorry. I hope you can find it in your heart. I just got weak and fell victim and, oh. Now it's up to you. You look at it. Then you start remembering what he did in the past. Whether he was a good husband. Whether, you know, he had a, was prone to this kind of behavior before. And if not, maybe you'll find it in your heart. You'll say, all right, you can come back. Notice how you throw that butt on it. But if you ever, is that right? And he don't even argue when you put the strong term on it. He said, okay, baby, I, I mean, I just want you to accept me back. Now, the burden is not on you. The burden is on him. Prove himself worthy again of your love and your, is that right? Then you affect a reconciliation. Okay. When the disciples fell away from Jesus and became offended because of what transpired in his life that was written before he came into the world, then the disciples, on coming back to Jesus, they had to come back on his terms he would not accept them except they confessed not only that he was teacher but that he was law now listen to me good they couldn't call him teacher anymore my leader and teacher they couldn't even call him messenger they had to recognize that he that was in their midst who had conquered death was both Lord and Christ. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And if they were willing to accept that term that he is my Lord and the Christ and repent for having become offended at him that night night when he was betrayed the night when they went away from him if they could confess God and Christ and preach him in the right spirit yes, then he said you can be reconciled to me 
like a like a bride who got her white garment spotted up and the bridegroom is coming time to get on with the marriage and the woman's garment has been turned into another color so the scripture says your sin though your sins be as scarlet he will wash them white as snow though his disciples had sinned and fallen short of the glory of God yet in his compassion and love for them he made a way for them to return to him and in the blood of the lamb their garments would be made pure now he's not talking about no blood you can't wash a garment white in red right blood is a very hard thing to get out of a garment isn't it so is the life of Muhammad hard to get out of anyone who have heard his teachings and gotten his message in you I tell you trying to get him out of you is like trying to get you out of yourself and that's why the honorable Elijah Muhammad could preach with such confidence he said, if I teach you for seven years, said, nobody can do anything with you. Yes, and if you notice, and I, I don't mean this in any disrespectful manner, but if you look over there on Stony Island Avenue, all of the old followers of Honorable Elijah Muhammad, they may not be with Farrakhan, but they certainly not with Wallace. Yes, the spirit of their Lord is in them and they've been trying for eight years to wash his blood, his life out of them. And the life that is in them from him, it's still there. And just a word in that direction will start that life coming back up again. And if they will submit to him and recognize him as not messenger but Lord and Christ, then he in his compassion will wash their sin sick souls in his life in the life that he lived for us in the life that he gave for us now the core of this subject I'm so sorry that this is not on the radio or not on television one of these days if it be the will of Allah look beloved every one of you that sit here have heard something about the honorable Elijah Muhammad's domestic life right you've heard kind of nasty things about this man whom I preach to you and the world is that right if you read a paper called Night Moves, which was given out free, which carried in it pages of slander against the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Now, some of you read the slander of the slanderer and you are so badly affected by it that you don't want to hear anything that we have to say about the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. You have heard that he had wives and children. Some of you. Most of you. Because Mr. Muhammad's personal life has become dinner table discussion in the homes of America and God wants it that way. Why would God want this kind of thing? <laughs> Not against his servant, it is for your good. But you and I, at first, we talk about it in a negative way. There are some Muslims who treat the domestic life of Elijah Muhammad as something that they want to excuse. 
oh well, they say, he's my leader and teacher. And he taught me to do good. So if something happened in his life and he went bad, who am I to judge him? All praise is due to Allah. I'm just telling you what some Muslims say. They are making quote unquote an apology for his domestic life or it's a rationale and a weak one for continuing to follow a man that taught us right but was not right himself. Now, what are you doing? What are you saying? What's going on in your brain as you do this? You know, when you excuse the messenger in your own little silly way, it's not him you're excusing. It's you. You're excusing yourself. I want you to listen to me. Every Muslim that has fallen back into the world fell because they stumbled over this critical part of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's life, his domestic life. Malcolm stumbled over this part of Elijah Muhammad's life. Now you all are familiar with Malcolm, aren't you? Aren't you? Some of you love Malcolm greatly, is that right? Adore him. Yes, you do. Some of us do not adore him. We know him, thanks to Almighty God, Allah, through the guidance of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and the teachings of the Quran and Bible, we understand his fall and we want to be guided in a way that we don't repeat his history. God made Malcolm an example for us to study. I don't have time today to go into Malcolm's life because that's not our subject. But Malcolm learned of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's domestic life. He knew it nearly a year before Malcolm made it public. All during the time that Malcolm learned that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad had wives and children, Malcolm for that year was preaching that Elijah Muhammad was the messenger of Allah, but he was weakening in his faith in the messenger because of what he learned of the messenger's domestic life. Go ahead. The messenger of Allah's domestic life comes up in the 33rd chapter of the Holy Quran. Three, as the Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us, represents a trial. Now, if the Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught us that one wife is best, and that's what he taught us, and he punished us if we fell victim to fornication and adultery. He put us out of the society. Some of you that are longtime followers of the messenger, maybe you got a little time for fornication. Or maybe you got a lot of time for adultery. So when you heard that Elijah Muhammad had wives, you said, what? Now how we react to his domestic life brings up out of us things in us that are hiding deep down in us that we ourselves don't know is in us. Now God is bringing a manifestation of defects. So he makes his messenger to serve as that instrument by which things are manifested in the character 
and in the recesses of the hearts and minds of men and women, especially those closest to him. Some say, well, if this was the case, why didn't he tell us? I mean, after all, he should have told us. If the messenger had wives, it wasn't, shouldn't have been no secret. Why didn't he tell us? Why should he tell you that? The knowledge of which would have made trouble for you if you did not have a base in you to understand it. It was necessary that it be kept a secret for a certain time. There is nothing wrong with a secret if the keeping of that secret is for the benefit of the people. There are things that people should know and all things maybe you should know but at the proper time. There are things you can tell people before they're ready to hear it and it will blow their mind even though what you're telling them is the truth. Where's your witness for that in the scripture? Jesus had many things that he could have told the people, but he said, there are many things that I could tell you, but what? You cannot bear it now. Meaning what? What I have to tell you is the truth, but your mind is not strong enough. Your mind is not conditioned enough for the truth that you can bear the heavy weight of this knowledge. Well, it's all right. It's going to come to you after I'm gone, but it will come to you. You'll be better prepared to handle it then. Malcolm got into that knowledge and Wallace got into that knowledge and it brought out of both of these men something that they had in them against the divine man that was their teacher. Now look, you know there are many children that say they love their father. Many daughters that say they love their mother. But love is not a fickle thing. Love is a thing that helps you to understand when knowledge comes to you concerning someone that you say you love, then that knowledge and your understanding helps you to deal with that person and your faith never wavers. Now you may say, well, what are you getting at, Farrakhan? You want to condemn some of you Elijah Muhammad because he had wives. But yet, you won't condemn Abraham. Abraham is the father of the righteous. And God makes every one of you, he makes Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad confess Abraham as a father. And Abraham had wives. What are you going to say about that? He makes all of you bear witness to the greatness of Moses. And he tells Moses that he's so happy over Moses that his last man is going to be a man like unto Moses. And Moses had what? Come on, talk back to me. You didn't hear me. I didn't hear you. Did Moses have wives? He did. Yes, sir. Well, if Moses had wives and Abraham had wives for a filthy purpose, why did God make Abraham the model of virtue and righteousness for every righteous person on earth? And why does God give Moses more prominence in both the Bible and Quran than any other prophet if these men were wicked men because they had Wives. Talk back to me. You ain't never thought of it, right? I bet you, when you need comfort, sisters, you didn't read the Bible. You open your Bible and you read David's Psalms. Talk to me. And you say, Lord, the Lord is my shepherd. 
I shall not want. Don't you say it. Yes, sir. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. Oh, you just praise David. I will look to the hills from which cometh my help. Yes, sir. Huh? Yes, sir. Oh, you love to recite the beautiful Psalms of David. David had wives. <laughs> and God loved David so much. Is everybody all right? I know you're all right. I just want to get you over a threshold. Because if you don't divorce yourself from the wrong kind of thinking about the honorable Elijah Muhammad and his domestic life, you will never see the kingdom of God, nor the hereafter, nor will you and I ever be purified of our own dross and our own filth and our own weakness nor will the brown germ that has given the black man trouble from the time Allah created himself be able to be exposed and gotten rid of if you don't have a right attitude toward the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's domestic life. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Come on. I'm going after something. You got a couple minutes? Thank you for coming, my brother. Thank you for coming. And thank you too, sister. I know that I'm taking a little time. <laughs> God loved David. David had wives. God said of David that he had a heart after God's own heart. Yes, sir. That's in your Bible. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Isn't that right? Yes, sir. You boast in the wisdom of Solomon, don't you? Yes, sir. Solomon had wives right. and other things. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Now, no, you said, but that was back there. You don't put that stuff over on us. That was in them old days. Your Bible says, I am God and I change not. Yes, sir. So if his pattern of love was the same for his prophets of yesterday and they had wives, why should he change now? Because white folks have some kind of thought yes, sir. Yes, sir. contrary to that. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Look, look at the whole world marvels at Muhammad. Yes, sir. Do you know who the most popular man in history is? The man that is the most renowned, the most well-known man of all time is not Muhammad Ali. It is Prophet Muhammad of Arabia. He's the most known, respected, revered man in the history of the world. And all this good that came from Muhammad, but Muhammad had wives. Listen, if Elijah Muhammad is the seal of the prophets, and to seal means to finish up, to end up, to seal up their work by fulfilling them and their histories, and then closing out their history and opening up a whole new history, then his life has to touch the lives of all those worthies that went before him. All right. Now, I'm not going to go deep into this today because I see that you, uh, you are a little tired and you have cookout on your mind and barbecue, maybe ham and lamb and lamb. But, and I don't want to keep you long, but I'm going to make a statement that I'll come back later with and teach on. In the 33rd chapter of the Holy Quran, the subject of the wives of Muhammad is introduced. And in the 40th verse of the 33rd chapter, if you have your Quran, Open it up to 33 and 40, which is a very important section of the Quran. 
Now, Allah is making a statement about his servant. Now listen to what Allah says. Muhammad is not the father of any of your men. But, and look at that word. Muhammad had sons, they died. What does this mean? Muhammad is not the father of any of your men, but he is the messenger of Allah and the seal of the prophets, and Allah is ever knower of all things. Now, what does Allah want us to see here? Muhammad is going to be in your midst doing the work for 40 years. At the end of that 40 years, you and I are going to go under a what? Trial. A trial. Yes, and what will the root of that trial be? The domestic life of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Yes, now if you look at the nation of Islam, Malcolm gave us a sign, didn't he? Yes, when Malcolm left the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, what was the thing that Malcolm hurled in Elijah Muhammad's face? Come on! Did, did Malcolm ever say that Elijah Muhammad did not tell black people the truth? Did he? No, he didn't. Did he say that Elijah Muhammad didn't have the best program for black people in America? He didn't say that. What was Malcolm's excuse for leaving his messenger? He said Elijah Muhammad had secretaries. Is that right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He didn't dignify it and call them wives. He used a filthy term because he felt that using that kind of filthy terminology yes, would separate you from your leader and you would divorce your leader and go to hell. Yes, sir. Come on. Malcolm was trying to drive a wedge between the leader and the black people who wanted to follow him by using the domestic life of Elijah Muhammad as a child. That's right, that's right. So good. Come on. Do you understand? Yes, sir. It is very plain, isn't it? Yes, sir. Let's go a little further. Yes, sir. Now, Malcolm thought, you all all right? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Malcolm thought that if he could say these things against the Honorable Elijah Muhammad in public, that the public would reject Elijah Muhammad's leadership and then Malcolm would be the great leader of the people because Malcolm felt he was more righteous and more worthy than his own teacher. And this comes out, if you study Malcolm's own words, this comes right out in the language of that man's speech. He said, I had more faith in Elijah Muhammad than Elijah Muhammad had in himself. Yes, yes, sir. Sir. Now wait, 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 wait. Let's not jump off the log. I hope you all are listening out there in nearly 40 cities around the country. Don't go to sleep now. You may go to sleep permanently. Listen well. Malcolm, in saying to us that he had more faith in his leader than the leader had in himself, if you study the disciples of Jesus, Judas among the disciples, Why do I say that? Because if we had a test after his 40th year and we 
failed the test and we are taking the course over again, then that's to tell us that another re-examination period is coming up shortly and I hope we'll pass this test so we can make it into the kingdom. Now, Judas, this aspect of Judas, and everybody should search themselves. Judas had a revolutionary spirit. And in this revolutionary spirit, he felt that if Jesus was in fact the Messiah, he could go out and call forth the legions of heaven against the Roman authority and establish the independence of, of the Jews. Judas didn't have the patience to wait for the Messiah to go through his own course and become exalted with that power. Yes, so because he became impatient with his master and his master didn't show forth the kind of power that Judas wanted to see. He then felt that he was a stronger man for the mission than his own teacher. When our brother was shot down in California in 1962, Brother Ronald X. Stokes, Malcolm wanted Elijah Muhammad to take all the FOI, go out and kill white people. This was his desire. The messenger said they could kill one secretary or ten secretaries. I'm not so big a fool as to take soldiers out before I know that I have some. <laughs> the messenger told me, he said, suppose that I led my followers into a fight with the devil and hundreds of them got killed. What would they tell me when I call them to come follow me? I'm leading them to their salvation. I guess they would tell me, like you got them other ones killed. He said, I don't care nothing about what you say out of your mouth, that you are with me and that you will stand and you will do this and you will do that. He said, I tried that in Detroit. When the police then had the teachers and whatnot in the police station. The messenger and his followers surrounded the police station. They had a fight and the Muslims whipped the police. And then when the messenger went back to the temple the next meeting, nobody showed up but himself. Allah gave them the victory, but they were scared of the retaliation, so they didn't come back no more. He said, the next time I take my troops into any kind of conflict, I'm going to make sure I have some. <laughs> so now, wait a minute. <laughs> so Allah designed a test to separate the followers after the 40th year of Muhammad's work among us, then the domestic life, of Elijah Muhammad would be used to absolutely separate the house and even destroy the old nation of Islam. Malcolm didn't affect the nation that much. Malcolm said these things about his leader and teacher. He angered the Muslim so till every Muslim that loved the messenger wanted to kill Malcolm. That's true. I wouldn't tell a lie. Their sisters would have got him. If they could have, they would have. Because they hated what he was doing. See, now you that love Malcolm, I know this is hard for you to take. But you see, beloved, you got to see what kind of character Malcolm has. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He is condemning an aspect of his own Lord's life that is clearly written in the book that Malcolm says he believes in. You must remember, Malcolm was not a Christian. Malcolm was a Muslim, wasn't he? Before and after his fall, he claimed to be a Muslim. If he claimed to be a Muslim, this book, Quran, is Malcolm's book. And in this Quran, Malcolm knew of the wives of the messenger. I was the brother 
Come on, brother. Go ahead. That first blew the whistle on Malcolm. Not for no personal advantage. The day that Malcolm was set down after Kennedy's assassination. The messenger quieted him, then set him down, just told him to be quiet. I was the brother that came to New York to teach in Malcolm's place that following Sunday. Malcolm takes me home for dinner to his house. And myself and him and Betty, well, Betty was doing the serving, Betty Shabazz, his wife. And Malcolm and I are sitting together. I don't know anything now of this domestic life. And Malcolm brings it up to me in a way that he thinks would damage my faith. Yes, and after he brings it up, he says to me, and what do you think, Brother Lewis? And my answer to Malcolm was this. I think there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his messenger. <laughs> now, Malcolm drives me to LaGuardia Airport because I'm living in Boston. And on the way to the airport, Malcolm tells me, he says, now don't tell anybody what I told you tonight. I said, no, I'm not going to tell anybody but the messenger. <laughs> and Malcolm jumped in his seat. Five o'clock the next morning, Malcolm called me. He said, brother, I wish you would give me time to get a letter off to the messenger explaining to him why I said to you what I said. And I told Malcolm that I didn't want to get in between two wise men. He said, brother, there ain't but one wise man. I said, I, I agree with that. <laughs> I said, it's going to take me some time to get my head together just to write what you said. I said, so if in that time you can get your letter of explanation off, you do it. Because the day after, I said this to Malcolm. In fact, that morning on the, pl uh, on the phone when I said that to Malcolm, my head was so tore up, I prayed to Allah. And that morning I went in my study and opened my Quran to the 33rd chapter, which is the first time I had ever seen it. And I began reading the domestic life of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I called Malcolm, jumped on a plane, and flew to New York and showed Malcolm in the Quran where Muhammad had wives. And do you know what Malcolm said to me? He said, brother, I know that. He said, but you can't handle this. He said, you be quiet. I'm the one that will handle this. Now, at that time, Malcolm was still a follower of the messenger. These are things you don't know. But I know, and it's my duty today to educate you all and the whole world concerning Malcolm and the conflict with Malcolm and his teacher. Because in that conflict, you will lose your salvation and go to hell if you don't understand what is at the root of that so-called conflict between the student and his master. <laughs> Malcolm later... When he broke with the messenger, he never used the Quran to support Elijah Muhammad. He never used the Quran to defend Elijah Muhammad. He never used the scripture to defend his Lord, even though Malcolm preached that Elijah Muhammad was the seal of the prophet and he had to fulfill what is written in the lives of the former prophets. Malcolm never used the book. Malcolm used what he felt would be effective in the minds of his corrupt listeners. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And so he tried to damage you from ever coming to the messenger by making you think that this holy man, this good man, took some women and had them. Look at this. And some of you... Come on, brother. When you heard it in your ear, you reacted two ways. Some said, I don't believe it. Others said, I believe it and I'm through with the nation. Others said, well, I'll make up an apology. I don't care what he did. That's his business. I ain't getting into his business. But I don't care what your answer was. 
If you answered, I don't care, that's his business, you still got a seed in you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. And that seed has to come out. Otherwise, you will stumble and fall today and lose your salvation and become divorced from your Lord for the real last time. Yes, Those of you who say, I don't understand it and I don't care to understand it and it ain't, I, I just, I, I, don't, I don't even want to deal with that. That's a coward. And ultimately, you're going to be forced to deal with his domestic life because you don't know whether you really believe in that man or not unless you are confronted with his domestic life. Look at it square in the face. Try your best to understand it from the view of God and then walk on through it right into the kingdom. But if you fail, this time you hit it into the chastisement of Allah. That's right. Now, I can complete this. When Malcolm did this against the messenger, the messenger said, Malcolm stumbled and I fought harder with the truth. And if you look at Elijah Muhammad in the last 10 years, now Malcolm made his break from the messenger in 64. Malcolm died or was assassinated in 65. And from 65 to 75, you had 10 more years, and Elijah Muhammad went to work. Right. Right. And in that last 10 years that he was among us, he did phenomenal things right. for black people in this country. Right. So much so that black people begin to just sweep this domestic problem, say, oh man, later for that. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Later for that. Yes, sir. I mean, hell, you know, I'm a man. Yes, sir. Later for that. The man's the greatest. Now, this, is, this is the way black men are looking at it. Oh, hell, man, that ain't nothing. Yes, sir. Why that old Malcolm? Shoot. That ain't nothing. But even saying it like that, it is something. Because if Elijah Muhammad is guilty of sin, you have no right to sweep it under the rug. But the Quran tells you it is dangerous to impute sin to a messenger of God. Messengers don't commit sin. Now then, if he didn't commit sin and it looks like sin, then you got to understand it or you fall. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Everybody all right? Yes, sir. This is what you call the nitty gritty. <laughs> Brother said the real nitty gritty. <laughs> Now, I'm not going to go all the way with this today, but I just want to whet your appetite and make you think, beloved, because you're going to have to think today. That's the only way we can get out of this is to think. Now, look, beloved, we're not about excusing a man for sin because we are not permitted to excuse sin. We're not about to sweep sin under the rug and make sin look righteous. But if God has ordered this in his holy book and he ordered it with Abraham, he ordered it with Moses, he ordered it with David, and he ordered it with Muhammad of Arabia, yes, and he ordered it with his last messenger, you are condemning God for his comprehensive knowledge of what he's ordering with your narrow self-righteous judgment and in that you corrupt yourselves and if you watch you take a picture of Malcolm when Malcolm was with his leader and look at a picture of Malcolm when Malcolm left his leader and you see the picture of a man sharp and brilliant debating Everything that came up and knocking them down. Yes, and when he left his leader and teacher, he was eaten up by the very people that he ate up in debate when he was believing in his leader and teacher. Right. You look at his beard, you look at his, the look in his eyes, the look in his face. He was a destroyed man when death came to him. In fact, death was a blessing to Malcolm. That's right. That's right. Because had Malcolm lived, Malcolm would have been in disgrace right now 
and Malcolm would have to come back before the world and say, I made a mistake. And whether Malcolm had the spirit to repent is doubtful because he wanted to repent. And when the messenger wouldn't accept his repentance, he didn't keep on repenting. He didn't come on to his Lord like he should have. He turned the exact opposite. And his own brothers tried to pull him back. He said, I've gone too far now. I can't come back. Pride. See that false pride that you've been reading about in your study classes, brothers and sisters. That false pride wouldn't let him return and humble himself to his Lord because he had become famous in the public. What the hell is fame? What good is it profit a man if he gained the whole world and lose his soul? He lost. But history has been kind to keep his name going for a period. And the messenger told us that one would come up that would make Malcolm's hypocrisy against him look like a little baby. I didn't know who it was. Everybody thought it was Brother Farrakhan. And that's the talk that was going around because I, you know, became the national spokesman after Malcolm. I was articulate. You know, I had a, a knowledge of scripture. I had a way with words. And the messenger was describing this person. But the messenger said he wouldn't love the believers. He would not have any love for the believers. So he covered what? I'm talking about his own father covered the son. <laughs> He knew his son long before his son rose. Most of you think the nation fell, and oh, the nation fell, and the nation is gone, and, the, and this cat Farcon coming up trying to rebuild the nation, the niggas crazy. Uh-uh. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad knew the rise, knew the fall. And while we were in the rise, he was preparing for the fall and the rise again. What you are looking at is his well-laid plan. You are looking at a master. And I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, our Lord. He masterminded the whole thing. Paul Wallace, Paul Wallace, Paul Wallace. Now, I'm, just, I'm almost finished now. You see two threes here, right? It means that that episode in the national life of the nation would come up twice. Right. You understand? Yes, sir. It came up once with Malcolm, a small child. Yes, sir. It comes up again with Wallace. Right. And then it comes up the last time, really, after Wallace. Wallace makes it possible for it all to come up. Yes, sir. Then the devils themselves get involved. Come on, man. Come on. Yeah. Listen where? The domestic life. Wallace stumbled over his own father domestic life. Yes, Not only did Wallace stumble, and I say this very humbly, maybe some of the sons of the messenger here today, but the family of Elijah Muhammad stumbled over his domestic life. Yes, Many of the laborers of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad stumbled over his domestic life. Yes, so at the end of the 40 years, look at what Muhammad said. Allah declares, Muhammad is not the father of any of your men. There's a divorce here. When he left us, he divorced his wives. It's heavy stuff, man. He not only divorced his wives, he divorced himself from his children. I'm telling you straight up, you can take it or let it alone. Some of the wives wanted the wealth of the world. Some of his ministers wanted the wealth of the world. They did not want the word of Elijah Muhammad. They didn't want the work, the mission of Elijah Muhammad. They wanted the glory, but they didn't want the pain. So the Quran said, whenever your wives want the wealth of the world, give them that and give them a goodly send-off. And he gave the nation a good send-off. Now they're fighting. You listen. They're fighting in the court. Over what? Over that that belongs to the believers. 
It does not belong to the daughters. It does not belong to the sons. It belongs to the believers. Because Muhammad is not the father of any of you. Though he's your father. He's not your father. Now, I'll tell you what I mean in a minute. Go ahead. Go ahead. They're arguing. No, I want you to listen. Go ahead. Because I have for a long time held my peace. Yes. Go ahead. Though I will today cry out. As the book say, like a woman in travail, because I think I know something that you may not know. Prophets and messengers of God don't leave wills. Moses didn't leave no will. Muhammad didn't leave any will. Jesus didn't leave any will. What is a will for? A will is for a father. Oh, mother, ordinary father, ordinary mother, that will revolves around personal possession, personal property, but the nation's property does not belong to any personal member. It is, a, it is the, the ownership and the rights of it are to the heirs of that man, and the heirs are not the heirs of blood, the heirs are the heirs of belief. Did you hear me? Muhammad is not the father of any of your men. He is the messenger of Allah. You don't go to the devil's court to settle no problem between believers and hypocrites among the believers. But since it was taken to court, Allah knew that too. It was directed in that way to bring out what was hidden. And what is hidden is that there are conspirators who tried to kill Elijah Muhammad. And that's coming up now. And thought they put it over. And if some of the wives did not take it to court, this could not be made public. So Allah was covering it all. You understand? He's prepared a great stumbling and fall for those who thought they put it over on Elijah Muhammad. Right. That man, oh, that man, he was so much wiser than we gave him credit for being. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, beloved, what are you saying, Farrakhan? I'm saying that as a father, he did for his children what any father would do. He did for his sons what any good father would do. He gave his sons homes. He gave his wives homes. He gave them the things that would enable them to look after themselves and their children. He gave them wisdom. Now he's gone. The divorce is complete. But now he says, after the three month period, you may retain them with kindness or you may dismiss them. Now, it's not talking about three months here, but there again, there was a three year period that the nation was to go under, and it did go under. And most of the ministers of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, who appeared to be so strong and so faithful, they love money more than they love Elijah Muhammad. I have to say the truth. Talking about us as a class of men, teachers. We love the things of the world more than we love the man who brought us out of the world. How do you know? When we couldn't get those things that we were used to getting, how did we react to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad? His name, his word, his program. I sat at his table and I heard him say one day with Sister Christine X. Johnson, who is now a director at the DuSable Museum, this sister was the head of the University of Islam at that time. And we were sitting around the messenger's table. He said, I'm a man like Joe. He said, you all are with me now because I have something to give you. He said, but will you be with me when I have nothing to give you? I was sitting at the table. I asked myself, when would you have nothing to give up if we came for the truth? 
But I did not know that one day he would be taken from our midst and even the truth that he came to give us would be made suspect. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. And under the clever talk of Wallace, we bit the dust. Many of us. Most of us. There are a few that never fell. There are a few. A very, 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 very few. Now those of you that didn't fall under that trial, you got another one. And you may blow it in the kingdom just because you didn't fall then. And you're proud against the new rise that's coming up now. You get a proud, haughty, self-righteous attitude. I can't walk with you, Farrakhan. After all, you stumbled. You fell. What do I look like walking with you? That's exactly why you should walk with me. The messenger did not choose a person to sit in his seat that hadn't stumbled because a nation had fallen. He wanted somebody to sit in his seat that knew what it was like to fall from grace and could be one that would stand at the door and not whip you for falling because God was merciful to me so I would show you the same mercy that God showed me. Come home! That has been my call for six years and the door is now soon to close. You will not get around me you can't get to your Lord, I'm going to say it straight out, over me, under me, or around me. You're going to have to come through the door that he set up for your salvation. Now, I don't want you to get upset, but I'm going to explain myself. You don't like Farrakhan. I'm sorry about that. I really am. I wish I could be more pleasing to you so that you wouldn't stumble over me and lose your salvation. Yes, but if that's what God wants, so be it. Yes, if I must be another test for you, then hey, yes, I didn't will it on myself. Right. Now look, beloved, as we close this chapter, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said farewell to us, and now we became offended. Some of us in our minds Wondered why would he leave us like this? After he had gotten us so far, we need him so much. Why would he just abandon us like this? And leave this son <coughs> in charge who hates his father and tore up his work? That's a good why. That's a good question. But because of that question unresolved in our minds, we began to think devious thoughts against the messenger. We didn't want to call him messenger. Well, Wallace called him master. Right. Wallace was not wrong. He was right. But his motive in calling him master was to get us out of calling him messenger, then demote him and call him a master of tricks. But he absolutely is a master. Nobody could do this but a master, one whom God has absolutely made a master. Oh, my time is up. My time is up. 33 and 40. He says to his sons, his flesh and blood sons, listen. You must now come to me. Not as father. You must come to me. As the seal of the prophets, the messenger of Allah, your Lord, the Christ. If you cannot come to me in that light, then I have no more part with you, and you no more part with me. You are not my sons, you are my enemies, for my sons do the will of my father. So there's no more royal family. That madness is finished. This is the son of Mr. Elijah Muhammad. He's the royal family.
messenger, no son of any labor, no son can see the kingdom on the strength of his father's labor. You've got to go there now for yourself. And the only way you will, you will recognize you is don't go to him calling him daddy. Go down and make obedience to him. As any other son and any other servant. Because that's the only way you can come back to him now. You come back to him as Lord. You come back to him as master. Or you don't come at all. And if you doubt what I say is true. You stick around just a little while longer. And you will see. And on his return, he will punish his son. Wallace is to be punished. Right. Herbert is to be punished. Right. Those that continue to rebel against him will be punished. His laborers will be punished. His, I'm telling you, his followers will be punished. Because to him, to whom much is given, much is required. And if we are not on the job working as he guided us to work, as he told us to work, in the field, doing the work, then we're finished with him. You won't be able to come to him and say, Lord, Lord, remember how I used to cast out devils in your name? He'll say, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. I know you not. So now the reconciliation is taking place. And it's so beautiful to see followers of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I'm speaking now of the old followers of the messenger who loved him and were faithful to him as best they knew how. And in the dark night, they may have stumbled, they may have fallen, but now they are getting themselves together, seeing the light, and they're coming to him, not as messenger. They recognize that was his station, but they see him now as Lord, as Master, as Christ. They say, oh, I, I come to you this way now. I, I, I don't deserve anything. Yes, sir. Don't recognize me as no son. I'm a prodigal son. I'm not worthy to be even in the house or to sit with the dogs in your house. But if you would just have mercy on me and let me come home. That's the way you come back to him. Unconditional. Hey, Dad. How you doing, dear Holy Apostle? Ain't like that. Every knee must bow. Every knee must bow. And you come back saying, Lord, I am no longer worthy to be called thine own. I have sinned. You come back in a time of grace. Then the remarriage takes place again. He takes the wife back. He takes the minister back. He takes his son back. He takes his people back. Because now you've come through the trial. And you are humble and submissive after your fall. And he, instead of dismissing you with kindness, he retains us with kindness. And we are a family together with him. I hope that he will not divorce us from him. I would love to be retained by him. I got to work hard because I don't want him to remind me of my fall and my sin. So I'm working night and day to make myself worthy to be retained by him as one of his servants. What about you? Will you stand for divorce? Do you want a divorce from him? You don't? Well, then we better do what he asked us to do. Let's get back on it. Now, to all that are listening, my subject is over. Now, I don't want any member of the Messenger's family who's here to think that I have a personal thing. Please, don't take my words and make it, make it seem as though Brother Farrakhan is trying to throw a stone at any member of the Messenger's family. Don't do that. I love his family. I love his blood. I want you to know it and them to know it. But I want the blood of Muhammad to know that blood won't get us into the kingdom. It is the spirit of God. So never again as long as the nation lasts will anyone sit in the messenger's seat because they're a member of his family. 
That's over and done with. Nobody will come to him except they come by the Spirit imbued with his mind, full of the knowledge of his wisdom, and in full submission to him and his God. Then we can qualify for exaltation in the kingdom and world that he is bringing into existence. Yes, I hope you all understand. Yes, and now to those of you who are listening throughout the wilderness of North America in my conclusion. The property of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is up for sale. This property rightly belongs to the Muslims. Those who believe in the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I am asking every believer in the nation of Islam, every one of you that are listening today to help us to retrieve all of the properties of the nation of Islam and return those properties to the people for whom he intended. And those people are those who believe in him. Never again to be sold except every member of the nation agree to it. None of these properties should pass ever out of the hands of the Muslims. None. And as a sister said once, uh, recently on television, when they asked her, what will you do with the property? That which he intended to be done with it. That's the best answer. Alpha Phi Alpha, I think it's called, went down and bought the messenger's home on taxi. They paid two hundred and one thousand dollars, I believe. But if they think they're going to party in the messenger's home and have a little frat time and walk around in a home that he built to be dedicated to the work of the resurrection of our people, I'm sorry, they have a wrong thought there. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Is that right? Yes, sir. I want to know, is that right? Yes, All right. We have determined, by the help of Almighty God, Allah, to retrieve as many of these properties and bring them back to their first state and return them to the believers and build from there and do exactly what he wanted in terms of hospital, in terms of school, university, building up the south side of Chicago, making Chicago the capital of Islam in the Western Hemisphere. Everything that he wanted, we are committed to it or die trying. Now look, I have asked every Muslim, bar none, to sacrifice one thousand dollars in the next ninety days. Yes, sir. Let's do it in less if you can. Yes, sir. Oh, where am I going to come up with a thousand dollars? Oh, hush! Jesus said, "If you had faith, the grain of a mustard seed, you could say to the mountain, be removed, or to the sycamore tree, be uprooted and be planted in the depth of the sea." O oh, ye of little faith, what is a thousand dollars to a mountain or to uprooting a sycamore tree? Go ahead. What is a thousand dollars? to retrieving the properties of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and turning them back into the hands of his followers. Don't you realize, new Muslims, you didn't pay nothing. Talking to the new Muslims. I'm going to say it again. All the new Muslims that are here. Now, this is not knocking you, but I'm saying you have not paid anything for the advancement of Islam. Right. You came 
to that advancement on the suffering and the trial of those who built the nation and fell under that trial. Don't you think that the new ones, in order to show the gratitude to those who labored and suffered under the trial, should help me retrieve the property, then turn it over into the hands of those who stumbled and fell and lost their faith? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Do you realize that if the believers knew that the property was back in the hands of believers, it would inspire some of them to come up from death for the second time? Don't you love those who labored for Allah and the messenger in Islam? I do. I'm so sorry that John Hassan is not here. I'm so sorry that those faithful followers of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad that died in this eight year period of heartbreak yes, sir. are not here yes, sir. but we will never forget them no, right. we will never forget what those followers suffered to help the messenger build a nation right. and even if they're not here to receive the property the rest of those that Allah has spared their lives will be here to rejoice. Let us get busy and retrieve our national property. Yes, now we've already started here in Chicago. And our pledges here in Chicago after today should be up around $200,000. We intend to have that money in less than 90 days. Yes, sir. And everyone in this country, if you say you are with me, I'm laying you under a burden to help me do this. I know you have your own personal projects going into various cities of America. I'm asking you to put your personal projects aside and help me in this 90-day effort. Every brother, every sister, let us think of ways and means and methods to come up with a thousand. Those who can do more than a thousand, I want you to give me two thousand, three thousand, four thousand, five thousand. Because it would be to our advantage if we could in September, October, open up the University of Islam again and take all our babies out of the devil's school and have them go into their own school again. We ought to have the spirit to sell everything that we got. Like the man that said there was a, a field and in it there was a pearl of great price. And he sold everything he had to purchase that field in which there was a pearl of great price. I am saying to us that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is the greatest visionary of our time and of all time. Yes, sir. And that man didn't buy that property on Stony Island without a vision for the future. He didn't spend that kind of money without a vision for the future. I would like to see the Salam restaurant in operation again. With the crescent turning, not standing still. Showing that there's life now back into that establishment jobs being created for the people again. Yes. If you help me to do this, it will look as though the nation never died. When they look around, the nation will be up and Allah will wipe away our tears of these last eight years and together in unity. Yes, sir. No divorce for us, yes, sir. not from the messenger nor from each other. Yes, sir. We will link up our head and our hearts and our hands and do the work that the messenger assigned us to do yes, in this audience today there is ministers of the honorable Elijah Muhammad who were excellent powerful men who now is returning to this labor brother John Shabazz in this audience today is a sister who is the personal secretary of the messenger who heard what he said day in and day out not for a week not for a month but year after year after year for many years 
How can a sister like this or a brother like that not be responsible to guide the nation to that which the Honorable Elijah Muhammad wanted the nation to come to? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. How can you stay back? You can't. Right. We have got to pull it together right. or we'll be chastised. Right. Right. I'm appealing to you to help me to do this. Yes, sir. Or let's die trying. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm not intending to die. No, sir. Oh, yeah. Not unless it pleases our law. Hell, I, if I died over a thousand dollars, I wasn't worth nothing. And if you fall out over a thousand dollars, brothers and sisters, oh shucks. Let's set, let's sign a divorce today. But we don't want to be divorced, do we? How many of the brothers and sisters here at temple number two are going to have that thousand within 90 days? May I see your hands? Raise them up high. Everyone that has committed themselves to that thousand, raise it up. Very good. Now those of you who are visitors, you keep visiting here long enough. And I don't mean to drive you away, but I'm going to ask you for a thousand too. Right. Right. You, you heard me, didn't you? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to get right in your box. You know why, brother and sister? I'm not playing. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You ain't got an ounce of play in me. Yes, sir. Yes. I'm going to ask you to help me put this nation back up. And I'm going to offer my life in return. I'm not playing games. This is not for personal enrichment, personal advancement. You have the right to take my life if I violate the trust with your hard-earned money. Now, you don't know no preacher. And I know there ain't no faggots here. These are men. Followers of the Army, Elijah Muhammad are men. We didn't come here to be made chumps. We were in the world doing some of everything. You ain't doing nothing that we haven't already done and become past masters at it. So when we come up with a thousand dollars, we not be nobody's chumping us off. Nobody's making a mockery of us. Nobody's taking us for a ride. We want all the properties that belong to the nation of Islam back in the hands of the followers of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. The true followers of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And so if you come here and you enjoy the wisdom of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, I'm going to ask you to help me to do this. And you will be the beneficiary of the help that you give. And all you that are listening to me in these cities throughout America, let me call these cities off. And when I call your name, I want you to let me know you're present and accounted for. Houston, Texas. Brooklyn, New York. Newark, New Jersey. Plainfield, New Jersey. Jersey City, New Jersey. Buffalo, New York, Detroit, Michigan, Jacksonville, Florida, Kansas City, Missouri, Macon, Georgia, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Phoenix, Arizona, Richmond, Virginia, East St. Louis, Missouri, San Diego, California, New Orleans, Louisiana, Atlanta, Georgia, Oakland, California, Seattle, Washington, Birmingham, Alabama, San Francisco, California, Miami, Florida, Wilmington, Delaware, Cleveland, Ohio, Kansas City, Kansas, Los Angeles, California, Columbus, Ohio, Washington, D.C., Cincinnati, Ohio, Indianapolis, Indiana, Bloomington, Illinois, Denver, Colorado, and right here, Chicago, Illinois. We want every brother, every sister, every visitor that believes in the teaching of Elijah Muhammad, set your mind for $1,000. Put it up in your conscious mind right now. Look at the figure, a big one with a comma and three zeros with a dot and two zeros with a dollar sign on it. Hold that figure in your mind. 
And these words that are written in the scripture, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me, and you get on out. Go to your bank. You got a bank account? Go there and tell the bank president, I'd like to get a thousand dollars, sir. That's right. Everything got quiet. <laughs> Go tell them that I need a thousand dollars. I have my account in your bank. And now what are you getting this for? <clears throat> tell them what you're getting it for. They won't accept that. Tell them you're getting it for yourself. It's for you anyway. It's personal. I want to retrieve some personal property. Something that I want to get that I saw that I liked. Would you help me to get it? I'm a good customer at this bank. And maybe they'll give you a thousand dollars and you can pay it back in a year, two years, and then come on and bring the thousand right here. Put it in my hand or in the hand of the secretary. Make a bank check. Make it payable to the National Center Drive. National Center Drive. And in three months time, by the help of our law, if we get the money, we'll make a try at getting the nation's property back. I hope you will help us. In fact, in fact, I know you will. In fact, I'm sure that you will. I will be coming around to the local temples. I've canceled the tour. I'm not going out on this speaking engagement anymore in no city till after we raise the money. Yes, sir. After we raise the money, get the properties, then I'll go back on the tour. And that time we're going to raise more money That's right. to put the property in the way that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad envisioned yes, it. Yes, sir. That's right. Yes, sir. We are the ones to make his word bond. Right. Go ahead. So I thank you for spending your July 4th holiday with us. And as long as you tell us that you love Allah and the Messenger and you recognize him as the Lord and Master and the Christ, there is no divorce. There is no separation. We're going to work till we can say me and my father are one. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But any of you who do not feel like you can help me in this hour that I call upon you to help me, that is telling me you really are not with me, then we will excuse you and divorce you from us. That's right. That's right. It is better that the few of us that are willing to commit ourselves totally do it and we get rid of the hangers on and the, <laughs> the yes, yes, yes and hallelujah people that don't want to sacrifice to make a future for ourselves and our children. The last thought I will say to you, what do you think the world will say who watch our nation go down the tube what do you think they will say if they looked up and saw the crescent turning at the Salaam and clean-cut Muslims yes. waiting tables like we used to, yes. serving our people with a clean restaurant yes. with that good wholesome food being fed to our people according to how to eat to live, book one and book two. Yes. And what do you think would happen if they rode from 83rd and Cottage and they looked across and saw the fish house open again. And your supermarket open again. And then they drove down to Stony Island. And rode on down Stony. And when they got to 74th, 
They start looking at something marvelous to the right. As you ride down Stony going north, you have to say, eyes right. And you look and you behold a crescent back up on the dome again. A beautiful crescent. And Muhammad's holy temple, number two, restored. Yes, purified, yes, rededicated, yes, and on the flagpoles that they put out on the uh, parking lot, yes, the sun, moon, and star yes, going up yes, in a little higher than the sun, moon, and star, yes, a flag with his picture on it, yes, up above the sun, moon, and star. Yes, you didn't hear me. Yep. That's the only man other than God Almighty who can fly above the sun, moon, and star because the powers of it all is in his hand at this moment. That's right. And that's why we call him Lord and that's why we call him Master. And that's why every knee will bow. I wonder would you like to see that? I wonder would you like to drive down by a wood lawn 4855 and see the messenger's residence Come on. not a frat house yes, but his house yes, where kings and rulers from around the world can come in and out as they did when our Lord was present to help us to carry on his work yes, he built that yes. knowing that he would not be here you didn't hear me. He knew the time and the seasons. And in 1972, he said, during the Theology of Time lectures, there was a certain prophet whose wife died and the end came three years after her death. That man knew the time. And he bought those buildings to set up the capital of the nation of Islam in the city that he wanted to be the capital of Islam in the Western Hemisphere. And he knew that I don't care what the wicked do, those properties have got to return to the hands of the rightful owners of that property. And the rightful owners are the true followers of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Yes, sir. So rise up. Ye Muslims, yes, we are fighting for Islam yes, and we will surely win with our Savior Allah, the Universal King. We are united with our nation and called by His name. So let us rise, ye Muslims, fight for your own. Fight, O oh, ye Muslims, fight for your own. Fight for your nation. And we will all be free. Fight for your nation. Fight for your own. Freedom, justice, and equality we now must have. 400 years a slave for devils lost from our own. So let us rise, ye Muslims. Fight for your own. Fight, O oh, ye Muslims. Fight for your own. Fight for your nation. And we will all be free. Fight for your nation. Fight for your own. The earth belongs to the righteous. Fight for your own. Allah gave you and I for national. The sun, the moon, the stars. The best of his creation. He is given to you. So let us rise ye Muslims. Fight for your own. Fight, O oh ye Muslims, fight for your own, fight for your nation, and we will all be free. Fight for your nation, fight for your own. The earth belongs to the righteous, fight for your own. Allah gave you and I for national, the sun, the moon, the stars, the best of his creation is given to you.